Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Hansen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> it's always a, a wonderful challenge to follow the Secretary of Education, but we appreciate uh, you being here with us today. Uh, my name is Bill Hansen. I'm President and CEO of Strata Education Network, and we have, I'll be the moderator today. We actually have five of our partners with us today, and so we'll kind of go through a, a bit of a lightning round. But, we really appreciate the good work of uh, GSV and ASU in this conference, and we're really excited to be a part of the opportunity we have to really help uh, our kids find their full potential and also our economy find its full potential. At Strata, we're really focusing on what I call completion with a purpose. Uh, we're working to, uh, across all facets of education and enrollment on uh, pathways and we're really working with strategic philanthropy and insights and research as well as our operating companies with the solutions uh, to help uh, solve our national problems. Uh, together we're building Estrada with a, a bunch of experts that are, are helping us achieve this and I just wanted to introduce uh, a few of them uh, to you today. Um, representing Estrada's education commitment to Strategic philanthropy is Adela Britton Baeza, President and CEO of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Uh, Adela has been President and CEO of Jackie Robinson since 2004, and she's brought just a tremendous growth uh, to Jackie Robinson's efforts and grants to address the higher education achievement gap uh, with our low-income students of color. Under her leadership, she's helped Jackie Robinson to expand its funding and the number of young people who are receiving scholarships. The, she's relocated the headquarters to New York City, upgraded its technological capabilities, and implemented new programs. And just two weeks ago, I uh, had a, a groundbreaking ceremony for the museum uh, in New York City, which will be a, a true uh, legacy to the life of Jackie Robinson. And Della is a, a graduate of Princeton University and Columbia Law School. Also joining us will be um, on the research side of things is our partnership on uh, consumer insights that we've been working on with the Gallup organization. We're pleased to have Brandon Busteed, who's Gallup's Director of Education, Workforce, and Development with us today. Uh, Brandon is a globally recognized education expert who leads Gallup's education work across K-12 and higher education. His career spans a wide range of important work in education, including uh, being an entrepreneur, a speaker, a writer, and a university lecturer and trustee. He is the founder and former CEO of Outside the Classroom and is a pioneer in adaptive online education with the distinction of creating the only course proven to change behaviors. And he's a graduate of Duke University where he studied, studied public policy and is a trustee emeritus. Representing one of our investments in, uh, in innovation and education is Bart Epstein. Bart is the founding CEO of the Jefferson Education Accelerator. And at Jefferson, Bart leads an organization that aspires to bring transparency and a focus on outcomes to evaluating and supporting the most promising education outcomes. For many years, uh, Bart has advised and served on the boards and owned stakes in startup and growth stage education technology companies and really was very instrumental in uh, building Tutor.com uh, into the world's largest online tutoring and homework uh, help service. Uh, Bart is also a research uh, associate professor at the University of Virginia. And representing one of Strata Education's mission-driven companies is Brian McAllister, who's uh, one of the co-founders of Road Trip Nation. And upon graduation, uh, a few years ago, Brian hit the road with two of his college friends in an old green RV that he stole from his dad, I think, um, uh, to interview leaders across America about how they got to where they are today. And the road trip that they took led to the book Road Trip Nation. And following the book's release in 2003, he co-founded Road Trip Nation to offer other students the same experiential learning opportunities that he and his partners had had. Uh, the organization produces live events, multimedia productions, including a PBS television series uh, called Road Trip Nation and the Road Trip Nation Experience Curriculum. Uh, which helps students and educators in underserved communities uh, connect with their uh, education in the real world. And lastly, uh, we just announced uh, yesterday um, a 
an, an acquisition and a new partnership uh, with Inside Track. And really, this is important breaking news for us. And uh, we are grateful that Pete Whalen, the CEO of Inside Track, uh, is with us today. Uh, Inside Track, as a lot of you know, lead, uh, Pete leads an organization that partners with colleges and universities to create adaptive learning solutions that generate measurable results. And Pete uh, has dedicated his career to leading mission-driven, high-growth companies that help individuals achieve their potential, including his time as COO of, um, at Blurb. And he uh, developed a platform, Creative Expression, uh, through self-publishing. Uh, Pete holds a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern and a JD from Northwestern University School of Law. So we'd actually ask the panelists to come on and join us on stage. If you could welcome. Guys, thank you for joining us today, and um, uh, I just am grateful for each of you and for the role that you play with us at Strata. And Brandon, I'll start with you. Um, I think Secretary DeVos actually made an important comment in her uh, uh, conversation today about employers and uh, uh, the results that we're getting. Maybe if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how far apart are we from what employers are uh, expecting and what our universities are producing. Yeah. Well, every now and then we have data that could almost be the basis of an SNL skit, right? And, uh, and this is an example. We did uh, three separate studies over the last several years. One was a survey of chief academic officers, provosts of colleges and universities. Um, and uh, it turns out that 99% of them are somewhat or extremely confident that they're preparing students for success in the workplace. So a pretty high confidence rate, right? When we interview a, uh, a representative sample of the U.S. population, however, it's a little bit of a different story. About 13% of U.S. adults strongly agree that college graduates are well prepared for the workplace. And then when we interview C-level business executives, as we did in a representative study there, uh, only 11% strongly agree. So this is, uh, this is not a gap. Actually, there's a statistical term that we call golf. <laughs> and I don't know how much of this is perception versus reality, but I think it's clear that there's a potent mix of both of those going on. That's terrific. Well, Brandon, we've actually engaged uh, since last year in a, in a very important project and uh, really to help uh, us better understand what uh, the voice of the consumer is and their uh, satisfaction and where they are in life and maybe uh, we got an important report coming out here in a couple of weeks so maybe give us a little bit of a preview of what we might expect to see. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the foundation of this really are two important goals that uh, Strata and Gallup share together. One is uh, empowering the voice of consumers in higher education, something that actually hasn't been done, right? This is something that uh, is commonplace in other industries. Uh, we have patient satisfaction surveys in the healthcare industry. We have Yelp. We have all kinds of ways that consumer voice is empowered. It's not the case in higher ed. And the other goal that we have is to try to create more of an understanding of what it means to complete with a purpose, right? Graduation alone may or may not be the ultimate outcome. Uh, if you ask Americans what the ultimate outcome is, it's, it's uh, a good job, right? And so to what degree are we measuring those elements? So this is an initiative that um, has now interviewed over 100,000 US adults uh, since we announced its launch at ASU GSV last year. Um, and the forthcoming report uh, that we're going to be launching June 1st is going to be the first of a series of major findings from this uh, that's going to look at how uh, people answered three questions. Uh, if they had to do it over again, would they change their degree? Would they change the institution they attended or uh, their major? And uh, one of the things that you'll see is that over half of all Americans say they do at least one of those differently. So the report's going to go in depth on those questions um, and it's going to be the beginning of uh, a number of insights that I think are going to tell us a lot. And one little point about this is an uh, interesting note. Those who started college at a later age are much less likely to regret any of those three decisions than those who started at traditional age of 18. So already there's really important insights coming from this. That's terrific, Brandon. I might just open it up to the panel of um, uh, any of the work that you're doing in terms of uh, the work on the disconnect between what our uh, colleges are producing and what we're seeing in the workforce or on some of the findings that uh, Brandon just spoke about. Well, I mean, just to jump in here, I think, you know, one of the areas that, that we've seen at Road Trip Nation is just, you know, connecting and bridging the, the gap between the classroom and the real world. And so much of it is just relevancy. And for us at Road Trip, it's, it's so much about 
experiences and, and facilitating unique experiences. And I think authenticity kind of gets washed out a little bit, but for us, it's really an individual approach to a student-centered, you know, based on their interest, how can they connect those to pathways? And for us, we really feel that those experiences are, are just, there's a value put on that. And I think a lot of research would suggest that experiences, when they look back on that academic uh, experience, that, that experiences outside the classroom um, are very profound. Pete, maybe I can put you on the spot too a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, apparent in the work we do in working with students that um, we hear from employers all the time that a lot of the things that are focused on in the classroom and during higher education don't necessarily translate to, in some cases, anything that is um, most highly valued and prioritized by employers. And so there is this, uh, you, you know, we have a massive issue in terms of so many students not having access to higher education in the first place. Another issue with a whole bunch of students entering um, but not finishing, but I think the, you know, one of the big issues that uh, I guess is a little, sub little bit subordinate to that and that it's a, more of a luxury issue is we have a lot of students coming out graduating, but then what after, um, it really was not setting them up for kind of a choice filled life and a successful career. Um, and that's uh, something that we've, we've got to kind of reverse engineer back into the curriculum. You're seeing more and more uh, companies that are, are saying, look, we've got to take charge of this issue. We can't just complain about what higher education is doing. We've got to get in there and, and, and partner and develop some of the curriculum that builds those skills that they need. You know, to approach it from a different perspective, the population that we serve, of course, is challenged with um, all kinds of sort of difficult uh, um, approaches to what they want to do in life. Um, we find that the students who are bright and who are talented in a lot of different areas are the most troubled in terms of figuring out what they want to do. And so one of the things we focus on is giving students exposure to what their career options are. Um, particularly students who are non-STEM have trouble figuring out um, you know, what their passion is, what the, you know, what the process is to get to that passion. And so I don't always think it's a finger to be pointed at the companies and the institutions and the colleges. I think sometimes it's a function of making sure the students themselves are exposed to what their options are. It's something we work very hard at doing. Perfect. I think Bart? <laughs> I'll take the next okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Brian, maybe I'll turn to you on the, um, you know, Road Trip Nation has also just done an incredible job on uh, documenting the consumer experience, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you could just share with us a little bit of the common themes from the thousands of uh, people that you've uh, interviewed over the years, and also maybe help us understand what are some of the resources uh, that are helpful to students early on uh, in their path. So. Yeah, and, and it's a perfect dovetail to what you were sharing about exposure. So, uh, so when we left on our, on our road trip 15 years ago, we were really trying to connect this, and we really didn't feel that we had a proper exposure to all the different pathways that were out there, and road trips evolved from that first trip. I mean, 15 years later, we're very much on one side, we're you know, a media entity where you know, we've got 5,000 videos on one side, and on the other side, we're an education company where we're designing and building online experiences uh, to engage you know, and to, to make the curriculum a bit more relevant. But when it comes back to this exposure, it's really one area that we continue to see a lot of um, interest, both from uh, on both sides, uh, from the leaders that we interview. You know, they, they want to share their story, and from a lot of the students, and, and we're talking the lifelong learner here, uh, we feel a lack of exposure to all the different pathways that they actually know that are out there. And so, for us, we've always felt that you know, let's get outside the classroom and let's embark and and, and design these these road trip experiences. Uh, and so one of those areas is actually looking at, you know, for road trip, being more intentional about some of the pathways that were out there. So uh, this last year, we actually uh, highlighted an industry sector around cybersecurity. I mean, this, this industry sector is, is growing at 12 times the rate of the average American industry. And I don't know how many people going through school actually are aware of how, you know, of, of this emerging market. And so an area that road trip is being more intentional about is capturing stories from leaders that have defined their roads within cybersecurity. And so we launched this road trip. I'd love to share a snapshot of what this road trip looked like. And it, it, it's, it's, we're going to actually share it tomorrow in a, in a, in a, in a longer view. Uh, but we worked with uh, UMUC, where we launched students to hit the road. And these are older students than traditionally you would think of. And they went out and interviewed people who have defined their roads in life um, in the cybersecurity space. So here's a snapshot of what that looked like.
Cyber security, it's kind of like just keeping people safe. It's just like, wow, this is sort of like a superpower. Finding clues and evidence to help possibly put somebody away or save a life. Who wouldn't be excited about that every day? Currently, every day something new is coming up. It made me feel like I could be like a superhero, you know, and who doesn't want to be a superhero, right? I'm currently pursuing my master's in uh, cybersecurity and digital forensics, but is this really for me? So uh, this winter, me and two others, we have a chance of a, a lifetime. I'm taking a cross-country road trip in a big green RV to interview top leaders of cybersecurity. I want to get like a picture of their jump into cybersecurity. Maybe that will give me some inspiration for how to go about it too. Through this trip and through these interactions with leaders, I hope to alleviate certain doubts and fears. I think one such major doubt or fear is what, what is next? I think the, the big obstacle really was like, okay, you're a girl, girls don't do this. But proving people wrong is a good motivator. You know, I, I like to thank them. I'm like, yes, you've given me the motivation to continue on. Thank you very much. <laughs> a lot of times we don't get to see or hear regular people like me that want to be in cybersecurity. We don't hear that struggle or that success story. So when you see somebody that has been through this same thing, it motivates you a little more. You're going in the way the system is set up. So what do you have to do? You have to hack the system. What is your goal? What are you willing to do to get there? So many paths out here that I didn't know that I'm just starting to learn from this journey already. I'm, I'm ready to take on this road trip. I'm ready for this, uh, this opportunity. Brian, maybe just a little follow-up. I mean, this, uh, uh, you know, when we were rebranding and renaming ourselves uh, a couple of months ago, just uh, Road Trip Nation and Inside Track and Strata Meaning Pathway, I think you'll see a consistent theme uh, of really helping people find their, uh, the pathway and their track and, uh, in life. And uh, just, uh, I think that really is a great reflection of what it's all about. Um, you know, just maybe one follow-up question on this. So the University of Maryland University College, which uh, sponsored this, is in the Washington, D.C. area, and this is obviously a very big issue uh, with the government uh, constellations and uh, the work. But maybe just a little bit of background on the relationship with them or uh, what their intent is to use this road trip for. Yeah, uh, so uh, the content is, is something that is... Uh, is unique, and, and I think it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to put a finger on, you know, it, it, the qualitative side to some of the data points, and the one area that the university really, really came to us was that, you know, historically road trips have been able to capture these experiences from a qualitative ethnographic approach of how these people have defined their roads in life, and so the institution really saw how, pow you know, not just how powerful a story is, but, you know, you, you talk about self-efficacy and, 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 and a student's ability to, to see where their paths are going. Uh, the institution really saw that this was a unique approach, a very innovative way to not just inspire, but to empower their students to, to define their roads with purpose. And, and, and that's such the, the joint message here is, is where the purpose is here, uh, that it's just not, um, it, it's thriving in an occupation. It's, it's, it's not just completing, uh, but it's completing with a destination in mind. And so they saw that our content can drive that. That's terrific. Well, mm -hmm. Thank you. And Del, if I could maybe pivot. Um, I just uh, really appreciate the, uh, the work that you're doing, and uh, for, especially for the, uh, the children of color and really the, those from uh, difficult backgrounds, but also just the leadership uh, skills that you uh, work with them. But if you could maybe just help us figure out what the secret sauce is to what you do. I just am always struck by the, the near 100% uh, success rate you have in helping your scholars uh, uh, move on into the, the workforce and uh, important jobs as well. And, and as you 
tell us a little bit about your secret sauce, maybe about how you're looking to replicate that beyond sure. the hundreds of scholars. Or 240 scholars, yeah. You know, I, the, the sort of quick sound bite is really that there is no panacea, there's no quick fix. And for 44 years, the Jackie Robinson Foundation has been focused on helping <clears throat> minority students, primarily African Americans, and we've been very much focused on that population these days because it is the single demographic whose graduation rate from college is actually going slightly downward over the years. So it's, it's a crisis. <clears throat> um, but from the beginning, the wisdom was, and, and this organization was founded by the wife of Jackie Robinson with a very austere board of directors, but the wisdom was that it was more than money, that it was important to give services and to give the support that particularly this population needed to navigate these new environments. You remember in the sort of mid-70s was when, um, I'll use the term affirmative action, very much came into uh, being. And so being exposed to PWIs, primarily white institutions, was a difficult uh, transition for, for this population. And so the idea was, let's give them support, um, let's give them generous financial support. I don't want to belittle the financial help. But the approach has always been and continues to be. It's, it's, it's evolved over the years, but it has not changed fundamentally that the underpinnings of what we do focus on building self-esteem and self-confidence, um, empowering these individuals, um, giving them certainly exposure, and giving them a sense of of you know, what's available to them, practical life skills, but importantly, demystifying the majority culture that I think and we've seen adds to uh, that feeling of frustration, the feeling of not belonging. Um, we are vulnerable to the claim that we are picking students who are highly motivated. Um, we get 20,000 completed applications a year and from that 20,000, we're choosing about 80 students, between 80 and 100, depending on funding, uh, fundraising that year. And, and so the notion is, well, wouldn't these students do well anyway? And this is where I think we overlap and where I'm excited to partner with some of the other people on the stage who are also Strata partners, because we recognize that, yes, we like to think of it in a bell curve. Some of the students would have breezed through, would have done well. Um, that middle, that curve, is uh, a population that at some point along the way we were crucial to their development. Um, and then there are those students who we really did bolster and, and make and, and, and allow them to, to actually graduate. But what we are really focused on doing is having these students self-actualize. And I think where we overlapped with the notion of completion with a purpose, what we were calling was self-actualization, making sure that they not only graduate, but they have a purpose, um, and that they are meeting their own individual um, strengths and, and following up on those. And, and, and we have, you know, just to give you a little bit to dig down, because the statistics are there. So we've given out, you know, $70, 70 million dollars in the last uh, 44 years, 1,500 graduates. But, but where we began to feel like our growth potential was, was with sharing the strategies for success and the strategies for figuring out what makes you tick and what will make you successful with the broader population. That if we were to continue to just add students, we wouldn't be able to keep the integrity of the hands-on notion of this. And so our scaling initiative is to um, take what we have learned over the last four decades, um, the secret sauce, as you call it, not so secret. It really is hands-on mentoring. It is uh, demystifying the culture, exposing our students to, um, uh, um, uh, you know, I like to say, I think a good way to describe it is about 85% of what we do is applicable to all college students, but 15% of what we do is tailored to our unique demographic, and that 15% of our programming focuses on things like um, encouraging our students to reach out for help. This is a population that traditionally has felt marginalized, has not felt like they belonged, so we encourage them to um, become part of their environments, to not self-segregate, to reach out and ask for help, um, um, to climb over the, uh, the, the barrier of feeling like the other. And so with our scaling initiative, we have taken some of those modules, modules like um, um, you know, make sure you find a mentor and a sponsor on your college campus within the first month of getting there. So someone who knows you and gets to know you and will be your champion. 
and, and, and teaching students how to find mentors, teaching students how to access campus resources, teaching our students how to um, 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 put themselves forward as leaders. And those modules, study skills, I mean the traditional sort of pathologies of this community, um, facing them with a vengeance, facing them honestly, doing the tough love and saying do not default to racism when you have a problem. Um, um, realize that uh, there are outlets for you to solve those problems, come to us to help you solve those problems. And so we've taken um, those components that can be uh, shared by technology, through the internet, and I'm hoping that, um, in fact, particularly, I'm, I'm looking to um, partner with what your newest uh, um, inside track uh, uh, people have been doing for a long time, which is, is dispensing programming online, and to saying to our students, um, um, just because you don't have the face-to-face -face contact that our Jackie Robinson core scholars do, there's a whole lot we can um, expose you to and give you that, um, that will help you not just graduate, not just uh, um, get through, but complete with a purpose, if you will. So that's the crux, those are sort of the two components of what we do, our core program. And, and by the way, that 240 students who are Jackie Robinson scholars serve as a think tank because they are generally leaders, they are mo highly motivated, and they give us a lot of information that um, if we are smart about listening to them, that is applicable to um, what we do. And so we, we really um, want to keep that core program, but then we want to use that as a means to inform the national dialogue on this particular problem of minority advancement and, um, and, um, and develop our GRF impact program. And eventually our job portal, 65% of our students in our program are placed in internships and jobs by us. Uh, we want to grow that job portal among our corporate partners and our other our government partners, our nonprofit partners, um, where we place our students and, and allow that larger population to access that as well. Um, I'll just say quickly, one may ask, how does this fit into our, our museum project? There is a huge educational component to the Jackie Robinson Museum. Um, one for the public, but one also that um, addresses uh, working with local schools, not just to educate them about this wonderful legacy, but to talk um, about some of the important social issues that I think we as a society have to focus on and, and, get, and get through. And so lots of dialogue will go on at the, at the museum about confronting social issues, what would Jackie do kinds of conversations. And um, a big part of what we want to do at the museum is, is, is character education. Uh, we do that with our Jackie Robinson scholars. That will spill over into what we do educationally at the museum. We will have forums on uh, character education. Um, we think it is time in our society and our culture now to uh, emphasize character. Um, and, and of course, what better backdrop than Jackie Robinson and Rachel Robinson to talk about um, how character um, allows you to be successful as well. That's terrific, Della. Thank you. And just, uh, you know, I, I love the, the museum and the concept of it, and I'm grateful that we were able to help uh, with the, the groundbreaking uh, process a couple of weeks ago. But I just would really like everybody in the audience to also know that uh, this is going to be a living, breathing uh, institution, and uh, really uh, grateful for your great efforts there to really make sure. uh, Jackie's uh, life a reality and his mission and his purpose a reality to. Uh, well, and Bill, may I add that when you know when we talk about at a at a conference like this, when we talk about um, investing, we talk about intelligent investing. Um, I've got to tell you, I, I, it is so heartening to me that you took the time to hear our story. Uh, because we're relatively small, we've struggled with um, um, our light being a little bit under a, a, a bushel. Um, um, but I have to tell you, I I was so impressed with Strata's approach to listen to not just what we were trying to do with college students, but how we thought that their leadership would impact uh, the overall community because we are creating leaders with a strong sort of, if you will, moral and, and character basis that, um, that you found that to be an important part of supporting us. And thank you for coming in all in and supporting every aspect of what we do. I, I just think that you know, enlightened, transformational support you've given us in every single one of those aspects has been um, a real boon for us, and it's a first. We've never had a partner that has invested in every component of our activities. So thank you for that. Thank you. I'm, I'm allowed to say that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, maybe a, a segue to your leadership in the student success and coaching and the, the measuring outcomes, and just I think what Della was just talking about. Maybe 
you could help us understand a little bit of what are some of the critical success factors in your model of, and what measurements matter um, to students and institutions that you're serving. Yeah. I think it's, it's well framed in terms of the very last few words there in terms of you have to, from our perspective, look at it from both the, the student-specific outcomes and measurements as well as the institutional, uh, more broadly defined measurements and outcomes. And, and I always say, um, you know, ultimately I, I find it difficult to measure the success of an institution but for by looking at really the cumulative sum of the individual success or not of all those various students, whether it's hundreds, thousands, or in some cases, tens of thousands. Um, and I think that's you know, perhaps glaringly obvious, but I think it also gets lost in the noise sometimes in terms of all the other things that you, you measure in terms of rankings or funding or research and that kind of thing. So at the student level, uh, Inside Track focuses very methodically on many of the things, Della, that you, that you mentioned in terms of what you're, um, what you're working with in terms of the scholarship recipients, um, primarily focusing on uh, how can we help students develop and then advance what we call the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and beliefs that we think are necessary to be successful not only in education but in, in life thereafter. Uh, and we break them down that way. You know, knowledge can be as simple as when is registration for the next term? Um, you know, how do I navigate this uh, labyrinth and financial aid process? When do I file a FAFSA? Um, you know, skills begin to be things more like time management, self-advocacy, goal setting, those sorts of things. Uh, An attitude is, is incredibly critical um, and actually can be shaped and formed. There's probably a lot of folks here who are familiar with Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Um, if you can get a student into a growth mindset approach um, and have that growth mindset help them uh, plow through the inevitable obstacles that are there weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly through a higher education journey, it makes, makes a huge difference. And then as Della was talking about, the beliefs piece is incredibly important. Um, what a lot of folks don't, don't recognize, especially with first generation students, underrepresented students, low income students, um, is there's this uh, pretty consistent concern or doubt about themselves uh, feeling, I am not actually college worthy, everyone else around me is, um, but I don't belong here. And when we do work associated um, with uh, the reasons that students stop out or drop out. Uh, it, it's often none of the above in terms of knowledge or skills or attitudes, yeah. but it's just this sense that for some reason I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we're built on the premise that if, if an institution is doing the right thing by the student in supporting the advancement of those things, the other things that matter to an institution that, that are the topics of a lot of these uh, sessions over the last couple of days, would and, and should fall into place. Um, and that's clearly you know, metrics and outcomes associated with enrollment, uh, with retention, with graduation rates, uh, with post-graduation outcomes. Um, and you know, if you've got all those uh, lined up, you know, how about student satisfaction? Are they looking back on that experience and saying, um, is this something that was worth my time that I, to Brandon's research, I made the right choices? Um, so as we're working with institutions, we like to ask the questions around, you know, on the enrollment side, look, if, if you're doing those things, you should be getting the right students and the right programs for the right reasons and set up for success. Um, and then what falls into place are, are very specific measurements around, you know, kind of more, more mathematical, uh, how are you converting off of expressed interest in a program? Um, how are you converting in terms of yield off of acceptance? Um, those are great measurements. Um, they're, they're reflective of how are you supporting, how are you, how are you marketing that program? How is it resonating with potential students who are interested in how are you helping uh, those students get through what is a pretty difficult set of decisions and hoops and hurdles. Uh, on the retention side, um, candidly, I still am surprised in a lot of conversations around uh, institutions or programs that um, actually are not aware of what the current baseline is in terms of a particular program or an overall institutional rate as it relates to retention. Um, you know, we like to see it measured on uh, a term-to-term -term basis and a year-to-year -year basis. Um, those are obviously your predictors of your ultimate graduation rate. Um, and not just retention, but also some element of progression. So what, is, um, you know, what are the efforts that you're doing around student success and student support doing to support credit accumulation? Uh, and then you know, the, the, the ones beyond that get a bit fuzzier, but I think it, it is fair to ask a student um, or to put in, measure, in place various measurements, is that student engaged? You know, are, are they taking advantage of the various uh, types of programs and services that are available at that institution? An engaged student is generally gonna be a successful student, um, and a student that you know, self-reports satisfaction with the experience is generally gonna be successful. Um, and I'd say lastly, it you know, begins to be a little bit of a thorny issue, but what happens after that experience matters, um, whether that's you know, the basics of just equipping a student to lead what we call a choice-filled life. Uh, it doesn't mean, need to necessarily translate immediately to a job. It might translate to whatever that student wants to do next. It might translate to um, you know, something in public Graduate policy, school. not for profit, whatever they want to do. 
Um, but it's, it's measuring those, it's starting with the student level, are you seeing those develop in advance and then how are they mapping onto what's important to the institution they should be, you know, sets of measurements that are fully aligned. That's very helpful and thank you so much and I just think the, you know, institutional perspective is so important on everything that each one of you are doing and, and Bart, I think if we could uh, turn to you and uh, just had an incredibly successful uh, symposium uh, on uh, efficacy, uh, technology, and education uh, last week, and maybe if you could help us uh, get a little bit of a glimpse of uh, just the, the, the learnings and the outcomes that came from the symposium last week, and uh, maybe how we can apply that to what we're all about. Sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you for having me here today. <laughs> so, uh, about two years ago, when the University of Virginia and Strata launched the Jefferson Education Accelerator, our goal was to improve education in two ways. The first was by working not with startups, but rather with growth stage education companies who are past the early excitement days of being a startup <laughs> and into the, oh boy, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> a lot of scaling nationwide, oh, yeah. building a team, dealing with district and higher ed politics, raising money, building partnerships, and doing real research to prove that their products do what their marketing teams claim. And as we set out to do this work in the marketplace, we were a bit surprised to find that there was very little correlation between company success and the amount of time and energy the company spent doing research to prove that their products actually have impact on student lives. We learned that sales and marketing are far more <laughs> correlated with success and valuations and exits, and we set out to do something about that. Uh, we started by interviewing hundreds of entrepreneurs, investors, philanthropists, district leaders, higher ed leaders, decision makers in government and research, and we learned three things. The first thing we learned is good news. Everyone agrees that we should be making decisions about how to spend $13.2 billion a year on ed tech on the basis of what actually drives meaningful impact on teaching and learning. Hmm. Then, <laughs> not so good news, we learned that almost everyone agrees that it's not happening, that most decisions are made based on marketing, sales, distribution relationships, mm -hmm. peer group recommendations in which peers overly ascribe quality to their peers' decisions. So in other words, if I need to decide on a reading intervention for my community college, um, I will look to my peer group and ask what they're using, um, and when they tell me they like X, Y, or Z, I will assume that means X, Y, or Z is both proven and will be a good fit for me. So we learned that um, it's not happening. And then the funny news was that we asked everyone, whose fault is this? Whose responsibility is it? And they all had the same answer. I don't know, but it's not me. <laughs> everyone agrees that it's not their fault that we're not using evidence to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs all say the same thing. We want to build the most impactful education organizations to help students and faculty members and administrators and parents. But we are limited by what our funders will fund. And when you ask the investors, they say, we fund those things that drive growth. And in most instances, if you have $300,000 of free cash flow at the end of the year in a company that's doing only a few million in annual revenue, you're likely going to put that money into marketing, sales, distribution, branding, and not into doing any real research to prove that your product works. And why is that? It's because, on the whole, our education institutions are not very good consumers. They are not sophisticated consumers who use evidence and research as decision factors. And that's not because they don't want to. They do want to, but they feel overwhelmed by the quantity of information out there. There's more than 6,000 ed tech products. 
and more than 19,000 independent institutions in our country that each are expected to make their own local decisions about what products and services to buy. I think they're all here at the conference. <laughs> and, and this is not, it's not reasonable to expect that these institutions can develop local expertise. And so what we also learned was that there's a great hunger for more credible, independent, third-party information. There is no consumer reports of education. Everybody would love for there to be one. The question is, who should build it? Who should pay for it? Everyone has the same answer, somebody. And as part of our year-long research project, we brought together more than 150 of the nation's leading philanthropists, policymakers, investors, entrepreneurs, teachers, district leaders, university leaders, and we formed cross-functional working groups. And each working group had different stakeholders. And the purpose of this was to make sure that each stakeholder group was not simply talking to itself. I'll give you an example of, of what, the happens, uh, what happens when that happens. Uh, I was at a meeting of philanthropists and nonprofits this past winter, and uh, someone said, you know, we need more research on these ed tech products, and investors just need to step up and do it. They just need to do it. They make all the money. They should pay for it. And I pointed out that investors will invest in whatever drives growth. If companies suddenly find success from, uh, from uh, if they all bring fidget spinners with them to their sales appointments, and if you have teens or tweens know what those are, guess what? Every investor would invest in fidget spinners. And if having uh, real proof that your product is superior drives more impact, then we should expect to see that. So last week, these 10 working groups that were each supported by a research faculty member and a graduate student came together to report on everything that we learned and to discuss these structural barriers, things like what, are the role, what should the role of the federal government be in funding ed tech research? What are philanthropies doing? How are they using evidence and making their decisions? We had a fantastic group that looked at the role of efficacy research in higher ed decision making. And what they discovered was that fewer than 10% of higher ed institutions require any form of evidence of efficacy mm. before making a decision about what to, purpose, about what to purchase. Wow. In, in that environment, we shouldn't be surprised when we get products and services that are more focused on the things that resonate with buyers and so we have a long list of potential next steps and projects that we will be working on together with Strata and dozens of other stakeholders who want to improve our system. Well, Bart, that's terrific. Could we, um, just one of the points that Secretary DeVos made that I thought was very interesting too is uh, with the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act question of um, you know, modernizing it or as she suggested start over with a clean slate. I, I frankly think, as uh, one of the points she also made about the 36 um, million working adults that have a degree, but um, uh, or that have some higher education but no degree, um, I think that really, in some ways, when we talk about modernizing the Higher Education Act, but also modernizing higher education in our system uh, for the 21st century, is very critical for us. So um, maybe Brian, if I could um, ask you just uh, you know your thoughts on how we address the adult learner uh, population. And yeah. Um, you know, an, an area that, that pretty much, you know, was our set point in building Road Trip Nation was in a transitional time. And, you know, moments of transition, everyone at some point feels lost, displaced. You know, there's a period of ambiguity, and, and that will hit you at some point in that, uh, in, in the academic, you know, student life cycle. And so much of Road Trip Nation has been built out of this transitional time. And, I mean, you know, with, through our partnerships, a lot of those that are in the room in our K through 12 space, over 10 million students in high school will have access to Road Trip Nation this year. So we feel there's a great responsibility to think about where are these transitional times? Let's be a little more predictive about when they're gonna hit these moments and how can we uh, facilitate and, and 
provide um, an experience that's empowering. And, and you talk about role models, you talk about people that have defined their own roads in life. Uh, how can we exemplify that? And so that's where our platform with, with our, our, our road trips and experience, these experiences uh, can help offset that. And so with Moments in Transition, uh, we had an opportunity to work with uh, the veterans and, and we launched a partnership with USO uh, a year ago to help transitioning servicemen and women from the battlefield back to the workforce. It's a huge majority, it's an awesome talent. Uh, you know, these experiences, uh, that, that these, these uh, men and women have had um, can be applied, they can be articulated and, and presented in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that will only uh, push them to, to be successful. And so in an effort, we thought, let's put a road trip together where these servicemen and women can actually go out and interview other leaders uh, that, that came from the same set point of, of transitioning from the service and have succeeded in defining their roads in life. And so here's a snapshot of what that road trip looked like uh, last year. No one can stay in the military forever. We all get out one day. It's just something that we don't think about though. When you go back to civilian life, it's different. It took me a while to overcome my depression and the realization of I'm out. When I got hurt, everything was stripped from me. It was taken away in an instant. I didn't know what I was gonna do. You know, I feel like an alien. I feel like I'm not even from this world. What's my next step? Where's my next calling? What am I gonna do now? And be passionate about it like I was passionate about the military. So we're gonna be going on a road trip. We're going from the West Coast to the East Coast. And we're gonna be interviewing veterans along the way. Gaining experience and knowledge about their transition to the civilian life. The hardest part about transitioning for me was becoming an individual. Instead of focusing on, you're never going to do this again, look at all the things you can do. Your greatest weapons are right here and in here. We learn to face our fears and so use those things we learned in the military to not just live in the civilian world, but thrive. These people, they are really just down to earth, amazing people. This is for home defense in case ISIS comes after us. <laughs> <laughs> Setting out across the country, bonding with all the amazing veterans, it's therapeutic. I even hate categorizing it, military life, civilian life. Everybody has different roads and avenues, it's life. This has been 30 days and it's been many things and I'm excited to see what the future has. I'm forever changed. Well, as we wrap up here, maybe Brandon, I can ask you to start and maybe even wrap up to how much time we have here, but just really as we're looking down the road here uh, over the next three or four years to uh, 2020, uh, where do you think we're going as a country and uh, 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 with learning and employment and, and if you even had to um, list a couple of top two or three things that you think uh, may be changing uh, in the next couple of years, what would you identify for us? Sounds like such a simple point, but I think we have, we have truly entered the era of <clears throat> lifelong learning, not as a goal, but as a necessity. Mm -hmm. and, and when you think about it, it's actually interesting. We, the, the number one phrase in college mission statements, we, we've actually talked about nerdy research we've done. We, we've analyzed all these, and it's lifelong learning. And then, then you go, okay, well, how do you actually measure that? What does that really mean, right? And I think the things we've touched upon here is that you know, this is no longer education at, at a fixed point in time, right? It's no longer simply about a credential, although those are going to continue to be important flags that people knock over on the way to other important goals. But this is a continual process, right? All of us, even in our own roles, right? Successful, uh, you know, working adults are going to have a continual need to upskill, reskill, all that kind of stuff. So I think you're just going to see uh, entirely new models evolve, right, that are truly going to be a continuum, not just these fixed points in time uh, where you think about the difference between our K-12 system and higher ed in the workplace. I mean, these are almost like castles with moats between them, the way they behave right now, right? So, uh, but, but the one point about all this is that we, we, we can't lose track of the fundamentals. And in all of our research, what keeps coming out very clearly are that the human relationships you have in education matter. You know, whether you have a mentor who encourages your goals and dreams, professors who, you know, make you excited about learning, care about you as a person, 
a real world work experience where you apply what you're learning, right? Um, and yet, you know, even though we know how important those things are, our statistics on this are horrible. Less than 5% of high school students are interning for a local organization. Only 17% have worked an hour or more in a paid job. Less than a third of college graduates say they had an internship where they applied what they're learning. I mean, these are unacceptable statistics on our work readiness and on things that are just fundamental. So as we have this great conference about ed tech and the promise of technology, which I'm a big believer in, we can't lose sight of these fundamentals, which are very human. When I was a young man, I spent half a year working full time in a daycare center for homeless kids. And at night and on weekends, I drove a cab. And if you got in my cab and you didn't like me, get out. There is no consequence for me whatsoever. Now, you get in an Uber, and if you have a bad experience, anyone is empowered to provide meaningful, actionable feedback. <laughs> we have created a new generation of empowered consumers who expect their preferences and their feedback to be taken into account. And that wave is coming to higher education. And higher education in many ways is not ready for it, and it better get ready, because it is a powerful force for good and for change and for accountability. Yeah, no, I, I agree to piggyback off of that. I think the consumer era is definitely here in education. Um, Somebody said earlier, one of the panels I attended, that um, you know, consumers don't know how to be consumers in education. It's part of the panel you put on as well, Bart. Um, and I, I actually believe that the public space is so questionable now. The government, what's coming out of Washington is unclear. I mean, I, I, my hopes and dreams are behind what's happening in Washington, but I think the nonprofit, private sector partnerships are as vital as they were ever. Um, I, and again, I'm not being corny to say that your investment in us, for example, is something that would have been unheard of uh, 10 years ago when I started fundraising for this organization because I wouldn't have had access to you. Um, I think it's partly a, a function of your outreach and your seeing this, but I do think that private partners, private uh, nonprofit investor partnerships are absolutely crucial. Um, when you talk, Bart, about how uh, the research is done but then nobody reads it, um, I would also say that the future for education has to be do the hard stuff in its most basic sense. Do your homework for if you're a student. Do your research if you're an administrator. Um, don't take the easy way out. Really listen to what students are saying. Um, you know, marketing, I mentioned before, I don't know, is that Bush or Barrel, whatever it is, our light was under a barrel. We didn't spend any money on marketing. And I've been convinced to do that by, by our staff members because they say, we have to have a sexier website and we have to, you know, put ourselves out there. And I was reluctant to do that. I thought, nope, let's just get it right and do well by our students. So there's this balance you have to, have to achieve between um, whether or not you are uh, putting enough uh, into marketing so that your story is told as opposed to investing in your, in your, um, um, in your program. So I think partnerships and I think uh, um, private and nonprofit partnerships and I think do the hard stuff, all of us, are two crucial um, sort of components of what's going to happen in education, higher education. I would just add two uh, things. Um, one is uh, to strive to strike an emotional connection with the students and for institutions as well as corporate America to humanize and build an identity where students and parents can, can just relate to. And I think we've got to break down some of those walls. Uh, there's a lot of different ways there. But. So I'm at the end and I have to say something wise that hasn't already been said, I guess. Um, so that I, I would just build on a few things that Brian and, and Brandon said in particular. I think the lifelong learning concept is absolutely huge and I think that the focus needs not to be only on the curriculum that is necessary at various points of the, of the journey, but the relationship. Uh, I've been in, in conversations with um, institutions where uh, you know, they'll have a session on how do they re-engage alumni. And you know, the first question I raise my hand is, is what, why is there re-engagement? What, what happened that you lost him in the first place? Um, and then a lot of the conversation wants to go to social events and that kind of stuff and raise my hand again and say, well, if it's about lifelong learning, why aren't those events and those things sequenced out with some kind of overarching relationship around mm -hmm. learning and engagement and, and enrichment? Um, and the one thing I would, I would add that's a little bit of a build on various others but slightly different is 
I do think the, the era of kind of transparency and information flowing is out there. I think it will be in the hands of, you know, if you call them consumers, whether those are parents, students, adult, you know, students, traditional students. Um, and I think uh, there'll be more scrutiny, um, there'll be more accountability. But I think on the positive side, um, there's a lot of data out there with which to make really informed, good decisions about what programs to launch, how to launch them, how big they should be. Um, and I'm hopeful, I mean, I think we're seeing it really substantially in, in just the last five or six years, um, really data-driven decision-making. I don't necessarily mean in a, you know, petabytes and terabytes of big data, you know, doing crazy things, but just the basics of, uh, you know, gathering little data, as I call it, and, and acting on it um, back to what matters for a student uh, in their, their learning environment, their learning outcomes, and kind of what they're experiencing on a campus, whether that's online or offline. Thank you, and thank you all. And I just, uh, on behalf of, of Strata, it is just an honor to uh, work with each of you. Um, and really, part of our new company is to really get the um, uh, synergies and the acceleration and the, uh, the growth opportunities uh, together. So just uh, thank you all. And we will have uh, a reception if any of you would like to come and uh, talk to these individuals or others who are part of our team. But we'll be up in the uh, the Riviera room on the third floor for the next hour and a half. But if you just join me in thanking our uh, group of panels, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.